to order. Good morning, good morning, good afternoon. <laughs> and welcome to the Committee on Rules, Privileges, and Elections. My name is Karen Koslowitz, and I am the chair of this committee. Before we begin this hearing, I would like to introduce the council members of this committee who have joined us today. First, we are honored that our speaker, Corey Johnson, member of the Rules Committee, has joined us. The other members of this committee who are present are Minority Leader Stephen Matteo, Council Member Adrian Adams, um, Council Member Robert Cornegy Jr., C Council Member Rory Lansman, Council Member Richie Torres. That's it for now. We'll recognize our council members as they come in. Council Member Ching just came in. And I just want to recognize Council Member Kalos, who has joined us today also. Pursuant to the New York City Charter 3020, the LPC is responsible for establishing and regulating landmarks, portions of, of landmarks, landmark sites, interior landmarks, scenic landmarks, and historic districts. The LPC also regulates proposed alterations to designated buildings. The LPC consists of 11 members. LPC membership must include three architects, a qualified historian, a city planner, or landscape state, architect, and one realtor. In addition, the LPC must include a minimum of one resident from each borough. The mayor designates one member chair and a second vice chair. The members of the LPC, with the exception of the chair, serve without compensation. However, LPC members are reimbursed for necessary expenses incurred in the course of performing their duties. The chair's <clears throat> annual salary is $212,044. Well, welcome, Ms. Carroll. Before we welcome Ms. Carroll, I'd like the speaker to say a few words. Uh, thank you, Chair Kozlowitz, and uh, we have some feedback here. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair Kozlowitz and Rules Committee members, I wanna, and I want to welcome uh, Ms. Carroll uh, here to this hearing today. The New York City Landmark Preservation Commission is the nation's largest preservation agency and it is of utmost importance to all New Yorkers who seek to preserve New York City's architectural and social history. <clears throat> our landmarks and historic buildings are our heritage. At the heart of our desire to preserve this heritage is our great love for our remarkable city, remarkable from the indigenous inhabitants, the Native American, Lenape people, remarkable through its history, and remarkable today with its wonderfully diverse peoples. At the same time, given our growing population, I recognize the need for New York City to provide housing and employment opportunities for all of its residents. A balance between these competing goals is what LPC must seek, and I look forward to hearing from you today. Your long history with the LPC is impressive. Serving at Landmarks for over two decades. Before your current role as Executive Director, you seem to have done it all at LPC. <laughs> starting as a public information associate, to a landmarks preservationist, to a deputy director, and then director of, pres uh, of preservation. In your current capacity, New Yorkers have seen you work with the LPC chair in carrying out policies and initiatives, managing the commission's $6 million budget, and managing LPC staff. Given your vast experience, years of public service, and your dedication to preservation, I believe you are clearly qualified to chair the LPC, and we look forward to hearing from you today. I also want to mention that we are joined by the former chair of the Landmarks Preservation Commission and a neighbor of mine and someone who is a great chair of the commission, Robert Tierney, and I'm glad to welcome him here today. Uh, Sarah, I, I really am um, happy that someone with your experience um, at the LPC, someone who started at the ground floor and worked your way up through the years, 
is being uh, put forward for this position. You know the agency intimately inside and out. Uh, you studied preservation in a scholarly way. And even though you and I have no, not always agreed on every single issue in my own district and in other places across the city, my interactions with you have always been respectful and you've had an open uh, line of dialogue and you have been someone uh, who has treated me with respect and, and I really am grateful uh, for the work we've done in the past together. So I wanna welcome you here today. I do have some questions in a little while, uh, but I'm grateful that your nomination has put forward and I wanna thank you, uh, Madam Chair, for allowing me the opportunity to make an opening statement today. Thank you. Ms. Carroll, will you please raise your right hand? Good afternoon. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth throughout this hearing? I do. Thank you. And do you have an opening statement to make? Yes, I do. Okay. You can proceed. Thank you, Speaker Johnson, Chair Kozlowitz, Landmarks Chair Adams, and members of the committee for this opportunity to testify before you. As a preservationist by training, profession, and temperament, and as a lifelong New Yorker, I cannot think of a greater honor than to be the mayor's nominee to chair the Landmarks Preservation Commission, the largest and most sophisticated preservation commission in the country. If confirmed, I look forward to partnering with this council, preservationists, property owners, and all interested parties in recognizing, protecting, and celebrating the architecturally, culturally, and historically significant buildings and sites in our city. This city truly is a vibrant, living, breathing entity, and its history is revealed in its physical fabric. New York is a colonial city, a Victorian city, an Art Deco city, a city beautiful city. It contains the largest collection of cast iron buildings in the world. It is a city of churches and synagogues, of vast waves of immigration, of post-war corporate skyscrapers, and affluence. All of this history is important to recognize and preserve. All of it contributes to the greatness of our city, both now and going forward, and as it continues to adapt to new challenges and new realities. I have spent the past 24 years working at the Landmarks Commission to ensure that this city's incredible architectural, social, and cultural history is recognized and preserved. These two plus decades have been a dream realized. I've experienced our landmarks in direct and unique ways, from up-close examinations from scaffolding 100 feet above the sidewalk to climbing around the crawl space in an early Dutch colonial house. I've worked on amazing projects to restore and adapt historic buildings and have worked with talented conservationists, preservationists, and world-famous architects in tackling complex and far-reaching projects. I've been amazed at the architectural and cultural riches revealed under our noses and in far-flung areas of the city. Most of my time at the LPC has been spent in the agency's preservation department, the largest department in the agency, including nine and a half years as the director. I've managed a range of preservation projects and overseen the application, implementation, and modification of the agency's regulatory policies. I've worked with property owners, architects, developers, and contractors to ensure that proposed changes are appropriate for designated buildings and neighborhoods, and also to help these applicants navigate and comply with LPC's regulatory framework. During the past four years as executive director, I've taken responsibility for the agency's operations and helped set an agency-wide strategic plan, including prioritizing working with property owners, elected officials, and local stakeholders on designations. I'm proud to report, report that during this time, the agency designated more than 4,000 buildings and sites, including 70 individual landmarks, such as Stonewall Inn and the IRT Powerhouse, the Coney Island Boardwalk as a scenic landmark, and 11 rich and diverse historic districts. During this time, I implemented refor reforms to ensure a more efficient, rigorous, and transparent designation process, including restructuring the process to ensure more research and outreach is done before properties are calendared, and making organizational changes to the designation reports, reducing the timeline for designation. 
I also led interagency collaboration to ensure that preservation is considered during the planning process of significant rezoning plans, including neighborhoods such as East New York, Inwood, and East Harlem. I am also proud to have led the development of, an, of a new internal database for permit applications to make the review process more accountable to applicants and ensure effective tracking and monitoring and the efficient issuance of permits and that I implemented similar transparency measures across all aspects of the agency's work. This includes spearheading the development of an online searchable database of the Commission's designation reports, permit applications, and archaeological collections. My team has also created interactive web maps, such as those for designations and permit applications, allowing members of the public to connect with our city's rich past and learn about ongoing work across the five boroughs and to participate in the public process. As a part of my vision for LPC, I hope to expand our efforts to make the agency more accessible and transparent. I am mindful of the critical role that LPC plays in maintaining the vibrancy of the city. We must identify and designate important structures and areas and preserve them. We must also allow appropriate change and development. We must partner with a diverse range of stakeholders, from property owners to communities and elected officials as we move forward. I hope to work in partnership with your offices on this exciting, interesting, and challenging work. I believe my unique blend of expertise, experience, and temperament <coughs> will allow me to successfully lead the agency. If confirmed, I will work to continue to preserve and protect sites that reflect the diversity and history of our city throughout the five boroughs and ensure that they remain relevant for future generations to come. I ask for your support in this confirmation process and welcome any questions you may have. Thank you. I, I would like to ask, how do you envision getting the communities involved in the process? Thank you for your question. Actually, um, increasing the agency's outreach work is one of my priorities. And I would hope to um, engage in community meetings, both in, er in areas that don't have as many designations and are not as familiar with landmarks, to raise awareness about the benefits of designation. Um, also, to do outreach work in areas that are designation designated to facilitate continued ease of access to the agency and ease of access through our processes and also to engage in outreach with our preservation partners and to collaborate on, um, on uh, discussions related to these challenging issues of designation and regulation throughout the city. Sounds good. <laughs> Mr. Speaker. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Speaker, yeah. I agree with everything Karen yeah. Kosselitz says. <laughs> So I am uh, very, very proud that the district that I have the honor of representing has, uh, I think, more historic districts than any other district in the city. I'm going to try to name all of them, but the Greenwich Village Historic District, uh, Ladies Mile Historic District, the West Chelsea Historic District, part of the Soho, Soho Cast Iron Historic District, the Charlton Van Dam Historic District, uh, the Meatpacking uh, District, uh, and I am probably forgetting a few, uh, but I have many historic districts and I'm really proud of that. And uh, we have the, the South Village uh, Historic District plus the expanded district that we got a few years ago as part of the Pier 40 rezoning and negotiations. And, um, you know, I, I believe that that's really important in protecting the character of those beautiful neighborhoods. We often hear from preservationists and applicants before the LPC that the commission is stretched thin and needs more resources. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask you, do you believe that the LPC has the resources that it needs to carry out its preservation mission given the thousands of buildings that are under its jurisdiction? Yes, and I would say that, um, you know, given our record in the last four years, we've designated more than 4,000 buildings and sites and in fact, um, the first term of this administration has the second highest number of buildings and sites designated since 1974. Um, so we have a tremendous staff. The, the administration has been very supportive. We've increased our staff by 20% during this time. And we will, of course, continue to monitor 
our work, um, the implications on other departments, and how we deploy our resources, and should we need additional resources, we would seek them. Um, and again, the administration has been very supportive. And can, can you speak a little bit about uh, the balance between, um, of course, building more housing in our city, given the housing crisis that we have, while at the exact same time understanding uh, preservation in neighborhoods and how we seek that balance moving forward? Yes, I think, you know, for me, I think that one of the um, really dynamic things about New York City is that change is constant. New York City has, is, has always had development. Um, in fact, the Empire State Building replaced the original Waldorf Astoria. So, and then these buildings become landmarks in and of themselves. I think that um, the constant change and growth of the city along with preservation both together create the sort of dynamic vibrancy of the city and both are equally important and can be um, balanced together. I think it's important for us to be able to identify architecturally, historically, and culturally significant <coughs> properties even before they've sort of come of time. I think this is the fascinating thing about the field of preservation is it is also dynamic. And as you move forward in time, perspective changes. And I think the challenge is to be able to identify these resources um, ahead of their time and um, be very rigorous in our, our boundaries for historic districts to ensure that we have captured the most intact and representative collections and allow for those to coexist along with the, the continued dynamic change in the city. Thank you, and could you speak a little bit about, and I think you mentioned this briefly in your testimony, and you and I had a great conversation on this, but if you could talk a little bit about uh, cultural landmarks, yeah. the fact that you know there are many communities in New York City uh, that uh, want to see things that have, have cultural historic uh, value to be protected as well, even though some of these sites may not have, uh, you know, the most pristine architectural significance giving changes, but, you know, in my own district, you have Lamartine Place, which was one of the sites of the draft riots, uh, and uh, some of the buildings had been changed, but mm -hmm. there was of significance, and the LPC under Chair Tierney uh, moved forward uh, with that designation. Uh, we pushed to get Stonewall to get that designation, even though it was already protected as part of the Greenwich Village uh, Historic District. And there are other sites across the city, both LGBT sites and sites that have to do with the African American Civil Rights Movement and other movements in the city. If you could talk about uh, what you think LBC should be doing on cultural sites moving forward. Yes, and of course the, the Lemmerx Commission has always recognized culturally significant sites, and oftentimes those sites are situations where the architecture is also significant, or even if not significant, like the Louis Armstrong house, uh, it's a modest house, but it reflects his, his, his presence in that house and the appearance of the house dates to his um, long existence there as a, as a resident. So um, the question of fabric and how it relates to the cultural significance is one that we grapple with all the time. And I think that um, more recently, we have been able to broaden our approach to that. And so in particular, the, um, the Sullivan Thompson Historic District, where there were a number of, of buildings that had been altered or replaced with new buildings, we were able to um, look at this narrative that related to the cultural history that sort of transcended the, the changes and the alterations. Um, and, and so I am very interested in looking at this in further and continuing to explore ways to recognize culturally significant sites, in particular where there is no historic fabric or, or altered historic fabric. Uh, thank you. I, I want to say that I, I'm really proud of our uh, landmark subcommittee chair. I think she has done a great job. Uh, in the first year and taking helm of that committee. As you know, sometimes these things can be uh, contentious and difficult, and I have worked with her 
in the lead up to those hearings and behind the scenes, and she has been a total pro. So I look forward to uh, Chair Adams having a collaborative and productive relationship uh, with you uh, when you are confirmed, which I hope you are, as chair of the LPC. And I wanted to uh, thank her for uh, chairing the committee in a very responsible and thoughtful way. And with that, Chair Kozlowitz, I am done with my questions, and I look forward uh, to continuing to work with you, Sarah. I'm very proud that the mayor put you forward, and I think you will be a great chair, and I look forward to working with you to ensure that we have great preservation in New York City. Thank you, Speaker, and I look forward to working with you, too. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, for those kind words. Uh, if, it not, if it had not been for your appointment, uh, I would not be enjoying immensely uh, chairing this uh, very special subcommittee. So thank you so much for those kind words. Um, Madam Executive Director, thank you yes, so much you. for being here uh, and being uh, in what I consider to be a, a rightful seat for you at this moment. Thank you. Um, I certainly do welcome the opportunity to work with you in the future. Yeah. Uh, I take this subcommittee very, very seriously. It's been a phenomenal challenge for me uh, in opening doors uh, to some things that I never saw before but more than happy and excited to jump in both feet to learn everything that I can possibly <laughs> learn about <laughs> the intricacies and the ins and outs of what it takes um, to make LPC tick and what it takes to make a true landmark for New York City, just not something that people use the word landmark, but a true landmark. And I believe that you will continue that yes. um, uh, in, in the spirit of leadership um, here with us. Uh, I completely uh, wholeheartedly agree with the speaker when it comes to balance needed uh, between development and preservation. It's a very fine line sometimes. And uh, for, for myself, you know, sitting in that leadership seat for the past few months, have found that that has been part of the most challenging uh, parts of, of the position and finding that delicate yes. balance between development, which we know is needed, which we know is a top priority in the city, and pre preserving our finest markers here uh, in the city. So uh, with your leadership, I look forward to continuing to do that. Um, I'd like to just, just one, one thing of interest uh, that has to do with diversity across the city when it comes to landmarking. Um, specifically, we're dealing right now with uh, the Harlem Historical district right now, mm -hmm. and it's been very interesting uh, to see the uh, the reaction uh, and the action uh, back and forth. Uh, the item is still under consideration in, in my committee, as you know. Um, we want to make sure that when we when we make our designations, that really uh, everybody should be happy, and we know that that's obviously not always the case. Uh, but we want to do our best when we can to make sure that as many as possible are happy with the decisions of LPC uh, and of the Landmarks uh, Committee. So with regard to that, we mentioned out outreach. Under your leadership, what does outreach look like with regard to diversity and diversification uh, of our landmarks in the city? So. As I said, I think that it's a, it's a multi-pronged um, initiative, and it would be um, looking at doing outreach in areas that don't have as much experience, um, perhaps areas that we're not actually proposing to designate at any given moment, but to start to raise awareness about preservation and interest in preservation, um, and then also uh, outreach in areas that are designated as well, because they also... I think um, once designated, we have a continued relationship with property owners, and it's very important to the agency and to preservation in general if they have a access to us and understand how to move through the process. So I think it's a, it's a sort of a multi-pronged approach. I think that with respect to designations, it's very important to me to be able to seek um, designations in neighborhoods that represent the diversity of the full city and all communities and people in the city. And so um, that outreach, I think, would really, um, is particularly in areas that have less um, familiarity with us, I think would really help lead us in that direction. Thank you. I, I agree wholeheartedly. Um, and uh, again, as 
has been previously said. I look forward to working with you. Again, I believe that you are in your rightful seat today. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Chin. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Koskowitz and uh, committee staff for holding this important hearing. Um, I also like to thank Sarah Carroll for being here today to talk about your vision. Thank you, Council and uh, I was happy that we had a chance to, to chat a little bit before. Um, you know, as a council member for District 1, uh, the place where our great city began, I feel that I and my constituents have a particular stake in this important conversation. Uh, our city, and in particular Lower Manhattan, is blessed with a rich history that is reflected in our buildings, our blocks, and in the unique character of our neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. Preserving this rich history um, is our duty as public official, and it is responsibility that I do not take lightly. Um, Ms. Carroll, you would be the leading, you would be leading an LPC that's gonna be confronted with many opportunities as well as challenges and with increased development in almost every part of our city, the pressure on our cultural and historic assets have never been greater. Clearly, there's much work to be done. Specifically, um, I would like to include the proposed expansion uh, of the Lower East Side Historic District, mm -hmm. uh, home to the Tenement Museum, and which tells the story of not only this city, but the country's uh, immigrant experience, and this neighborhood is rich with the living history of working families from every corner of the globe. And it is the utmost important that these protection be applied as soon as possible before this history is lost to current and future generations. Um, and in regard to your appointment, I've received messages from constituents, you know, uh, messages of support from members of our preservation community, including Richard. Uh, Moses, president of the Low East Side Preservation That's Initiative. Nice. Uh, so it is my hope that under your leadership, we will work closely and with the council to really advocate to ensure that our history and culture remain as an integral part of our growing city. And I just wanted to follow up off, uh, on what our speaker talked about in terms of cultural significance um, and you know, like in, in my district, I have Chinatown, Little Italy, who is on the National Registry of Historic wow. District, but it doesn't qualify um, as a historic district, or in a way that a lot of buildings are not qualified as individual landmark because of the architecture. But there's significant history, like in those neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. So I think looking at the Low East Side Historic District, I know the commission has mm -hmm. talked about some flexibility um, to do it in a way that we can incorporate uh, historic and culture uh, together. And also really having a way to educate property owners and community leaders that being able to designate uh, a community as historic or that there is a lot of benefits mm -hmm. and how to overcome those obstacles. Because when we talk mm -hmm. to you know, homeowner about landmark, I mean, the first thing they say is no, no, yeah. no. It's too difficult and it's too much barriers. And if I have, need to fix a window, I gotta get approval. So I think there's so much education that we can do to really get people excited about preserving culture and history. And it could be, you know, a great benefit to them mm -hmm. and to the city as a whole. So I really look forward to continue to engage um, in that conversation and, and really working with community folks on that. That's great. I, I would look forward to the opportunity to continue to work with you on that. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Carnegie. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon. As uh, you may be aware, I represent uh, the vibrant communities of Bedford Stuyvesant and Northern Crown Heights, which uh, finds itself as the epicenter of gentrification. Um, so in outer boroughs and in minority communities, there's a narrative that feels as though LPC doesn't work for them mm -hmm. per se, and that it's a tool uh, that's actually uh, exacerbating the, the process of gentrification. Mm -hmm. I was wondering uh, what you intend from a lead role to do to dissuade that narrative mm -hmm. and to um, uh, get more people involved in the LPC process mm -hmm. uh, as a benefit. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So I think, um, you know, it's an interesting thing. I think the, the, con the concept of gentrification and its relationship to designation is a somewhat complex and, and perhaps tenuous one. I think that um, there are many factors that contribute to gentrification and, and so how it relates to landmark designation, I think is a, is there are mixed ideas about it. Some people um, request designation seeking to protect themselves from gentrification and so others um, see that perhaps raising the cost of, of um, replacing windows or increasing property values also ha may have a negative impact in terms of gentrification. So I'm not sure that there's a clear definitive study on that and I think that there are, again are many factors that are related to it but to the extent that um, the, the Landmarks C Commission designates and, and protects buildings that can of course protect um, existing units in neighborhoods and I think that um, raising awareness and thinking about opportunities to ease um, the regulatory process is a very important thing to do for people who are in existing neighbor to neighborhoods who are afraid that designation might change the, the, car the, the demographics or the cost of the neighborhood. So I, I, I thank you and I appreciate that answer. I've had a great opportunity working with LPC. We've had some uh, major designations over the last uh, mm -hmm. few years, actually during my term. And, and like you said, there are there is mixed emotion. Mm -hmm. right? But I also am in a district that believes that bike lanes are part of gentrification. So yeah. it's a, it's yeah. a, there, is a, there, is a, there is an absolute delicate balance. And as the, the legislator for that district, I'm, I'm faced with those challenges regularly. Uh, I look forward to working with your office thank to come up with a strategy. Mm -hmm. Uh, that. going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Kalos. Thank you, uh, Chair. I uh, wanted to start off with, uh, uh, we worked closely with the LPC last term. At that time, I did not agree with the land use chair who wanted to pass a bill called Introduction 755, which would have put a five-year moratorium on any item that was not successful, uh, I guess so. Uh, that being said, it was passed without a five-year moratorium. Uh, where are you on the backlog, and do you anticipate being able to maintain a commitment to, I believe it is a one-year turnaround mm -hmm. for anything on the calendar? Yes, yeah, so right now there are uh, two items on the calendar, all, both of which were calendared within the last year, so they are not um, at the end of their one-year term. Um, we have, as you know, we, we embarked on the 18-month backlog initiative and we successfully designated a number of s really stellar landmarks. And so at this point, every um, new designation that we have initiated has been designated within eight months or less, and I believe the average time is about four and a half months. During that process, a number of items that had previously been calendared uh, ended up not being calendared. I think at the time, many of us in the preservation movement were glad for what we could get. Uh, what mm -hmm. opportunity is there to revisit some of the items that had been calendared sometimes for as many as 50 mm -hmm. years? Uh, that in itself might make it uh, a landmark. <laughs> <laughs> so we, you know, as you may recall, um, we went through a very robust pr process with four special hearings and I think really um, engaged the preservation community, property owners, and elected officials to identify priorities that could be achieved within the 18 months. Um, the vast majority of the items that were removed from the calendar were removed without prejudice, which allows us the opportunity to revisit. Um, it did not make a, dis uh, it did not make a determination on merit. So it doesn't close the doors on those properties and it's, uh, there's always an opportunity to revisit them. During the hearings on introduction 755, we did not hear many complaints from residents or members who were upset uh, as much as uh, I know what uh, my colleague was just referring to about and, and others about homeowners dealing with uh, having a building. The most were upset, I think, to what my uh, colleagues are referring to, just about frustrations with uh, the request for evaluation mm -hmm. process and feeling that that process didn't have a timeline, it didn't have a, a formal mm -hmm. application, right. and as a result, something that 
for a group of properties, uh, or in my case, I believe 37 uh, properties might take longer than folks felt. Mm -hmm. uh, so I guess, how will you approach RFEs, whether it's come from the community or whether it comes with the community with community board or council member support? Mm -hmm. And uh, I think you already touched on it a little bit, but uh, how open are you to going a little bit beyond whether or not a building has specific uh, physical characteristics uh, and architectural ar ar uh, characteristics to talking about some of the cultural importance, mm -hmm. especially I, I represent a, a very small portion of East Harlem with the new rezoning there. I am very interested in working with my colleagues who represent that area. Uh, Keith Powers now represents a similarly small portion. Councilmember Ayala represents the bulk of it to, to preserve the legacy of El Barrio mm -hmm. uh, that we're I'm, I'm concerned of losing. Mm -hmm. So I guess there's two questions there's there. There's two questions. So the, with, the, with respect to the RFE process, um, you know, there, the, the law doesn't have an application process for designations. And desi so the, the Landmarks Commission surveys about three to 4,000 properties every year in addition to um, looking at properties that are uh, suggested to us by members of the public and uh, council members. And so we always welcome those. I think it's um, a great way for us to understand what's um, on uh, what's out there and a potential candidate. When we review requests for evaluation, we um, always res we review it right away within a month to determine whether it meets the, the um, basic threshold of criteria for designation, and we respond within a month. Um, with the respect to the list of 37, that was a much longer list, so it did take us a few months. We developed a framework um, through which to anal analyze the 37 properties, and, I, and we responded um, in writing uh, with our uh, determinations and have actually moved forward on some of those and are continuing to work with the Friends of the Upper East Side to think about more of those on the list that we can advance. Um, so, so that's question one. Question two is l thinking about um, more about the cultural designations. So uh, again, I think that we have to be very rigorous. The commission has standards in determining um, whether something is eligible or not. And so we have to be sure that the um, the analysis of the property is thorough and rigorous and look, thinking about architectural, cultural, historic merit, how it compares with other designations, the level of um, alterations, the level of integrity. Um, and in evaluating all those things, we have to ensure that it is um, in compliance with the law. Having said that, I am very open to looking at things through a different lens, and um, we have done that recently, and I'm very opening to open to continuing to explore ways to do that. I want to thank the chair. My, my last question is just uh, the, the prior land use chair, David Greenfield, and I may have grown a, a notoriety for our back and forths and disagreements on items. Uh, and, and at times, he, he, he uh, often uh, made reference to trying to remove items from landmark status. Uh, is there any intention by this, by you as LPC chair, to ever remove an item from landmark status? No, there is no intention to do that. <laughs> Thank you. I can sleep at night. <laughs> Councilmember Powers. Thank you, and thank you for being here. And I, I just wanted to commend first um, uh, the nominee, I guess, for um, for uh, reaching out to me. I, I think I have maybe the most, I think, landmarks of any city council member, and care deeply about. It. And, and during this during this process, had called for somebody with a strong preservation background to be put forward. And I, I think we I think we that's where we have landed. Um, we are in actually, I've heard a number of the questions, I want that we are in a moment where ourselves as a city council and the city are engaged in discussions around the charter and the par powers of different agencies and whether certain agencies should have more or less different power. And I'm curious to see here, of course, you're not speaking as, as somebody who's the current executive director. Mm -hmm. um, if you have any, uh, any thoughts or ideas within the charter process or separate of that of places where you'd like to see different authority or uh, you know um, um, authority broadened in terms of the landmarks. Yeah, so I have not specifically thought about the, the charter and I know it's a relatively short uh, charter. So um, 
you know, I don't have an answer for that right now, but I'd be happy to continue discussions with you and to think about that. Are there places beyond in your current role today where you feel th th there's power and that doesn't, that the LPC should have more power or less power in terms of their, your current authority? I think that the, the, this landmarks the, the power that the landmarks law gives this l commission is, I think, pretty um, strong and has been very effective. Got it. And what about enforcement? Do you find that you have enough tools at your disposal to do like proper enforcement to the degree there it's a need for it? We do. In fact, our enforcement department just, um, we increased it in size recently. It's now larger than it's ever been. And um, we do um, respond to every request we get to investigate a potential violation. And, um, and we have a very good system that is set up to try to reach property owners to correct those um, potential violations. And the other thing I would say is that if we can continue to do strong outreach, we can also get to people before they make the mistake of doing work without a, a permit and being in violation. So that's another reason that I'm very interested in reaching out to neighborhoods. Got it, thank you. And and my last question, and I wanna thank the chair for, for letting me ask him to take some time. Um, there's a lot of conversation around development rights and landmarks and mm -hmm what's allowed and what could be allowed. Um, any, any thoughts on ways that you think that the agency would either change or would be supportive of changes or, or not supportive of changes in terms of or, or just contemplated changes when it comes to ways that yeah. zoning and development is handled relative to you know, landmarks? I, I know that there have been a number of discussions about transfer of, of development rights and I think that conceptually the transfer of development rights can be very beneficial to landmarks, particularly if it generates money to maintain and aid in the long-term preservation of the landmark. But without seeing a particular proposal, I really can't comment any on it specifically. But I, I would also note that this, of course, is a city planning issue. But we would be open to continued discussions with our colleagues at Thank you. you all and our colleagues at thank City We planning. look forward to it. I'm sure it will <laughs> come up. Um, thank you to the chair. I mostly came to see Karen Kozowitz today, uh, but thank you for that. And thank you, Philip Gross, <laughs> for being here. And, and I just will say I, I, I am supportive. I think this is a person who has a strong preservation background, who I've talked to many of the folks in my district with a high population of landmarks who feel this is a, a candidate who um, uh, understands the mission and has a background. So I wanted to come and also offer my support. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Council Member. And it's nice seeing you also. <laughs> Councilmember Yeager. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think we all come here to see uh, Chair Koslowitz today. Uh, Shana Tova to all. Um, uh, my, uh, I'll, I'll be very brief, and I appreciate the Chair giving me the opportunity as uh, someone who's not a member of this committee uh, to just engage in a slight back and forth. Um, first, uh, obviously, it goes without saying, but I'll say it anyway. I think uh, your experience uh, with the landmarks uh, Preservation Commission and your breadth of experience uh, in the field in general, but particularly in that office, uh, brings you here as a nominee, Madam Director, with perhaps more experience than any other nominee uh, to be chair of the commission. So for that, I congratulate you and, and the mayor for making a wise suggestion to this council. Um, earlier this year, and, and, and also I just want to point out, you know, obviously we, we all represent different kinds of neighborhoods. Um, my neighborhood is old, not as old as some other neighborhoods. Um, mine was farmland just about 100 years ago. Um, uh, Councilmember Chin's neighborhood was obviously a, a city mm -hmm. 300 years ago. So it, you know we have different uh, burdens and obligations. And as uh, Councilmember Chin said, your appointment is, presents you with opportunities and challenges. Mm -hmm. um, a number of months ago, a uh, matter came before this council, and it was uh, voted uh, to be landmarked. And it was a private home. Um, it was the Uberty houses mm -hmm. owned by Uberty home owned by an individual mm -hmm. whose family had owned the home for many many years generations in fact and the owner opposed the landmarking the number of members of this council opposed the landmarking as well in uh, respect to the owner's wishes that his property not be landmarked because as you know of the burdens that come along with that um, my question to you is whether in a situation like that and setting aside those situations where you know, a developer has picked up a piece of property, and obviously we as a city want to step in and make sure that there's preservation. But where we're talking about a private home that's simply been in the same hands of the same family for many years, do you believe there should be some sort of compensation of that owner for what I view as a taking under the Fifth Amendment 
uh, an unjust and uncompensated taking. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason that I voted against it was because I felt it violated uh, the mm -hmm. Fifth Amendment. I know there are uh, many people who view uh, landmarking otherwise, but I view that as such. Do you believe this is, should be some compensation to the owner to help a, um, make up the difference in, yeah. in their lost ability uh, for, for selling the property, but also the increased cost if they want to paint the staircase or change a light bulb. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, as you know, the Supreme Court found that landmark designation is not a taking, and, and we don't believe that it is. Having said that, we understand that there are concerns from property owners, and we work very, very closely with property owners prior to designation to um, give them some comfort, and certainly their concerns inform our decisions. Um, in um, and and in terms of um, you know in terms of our decisions of, of when to prioritize, when to move something forward. In some cases, a property is so significant. I think we're balancing those owners' concerns and um, the significance of the property, and I think we try very hard to work together on that. The, the Huberty House in particular was an item that was calendared um, under a prior administration, and um, it was actually subject to expiring under the legislation 775. And so we were very um, careful when we looked at the designations that were in place that would be subject to that, and I think um, we were, um, you know, rigorous in thinking about which ones were so significant that it warranted moving ahead given the fact that they'd expire, and that was one of them because of the, not only the architectural significance, the significance of the architect, or architect, but also its place along Bushwick Avenue. So um, it was a very important designation. I think that we have found lots of times that when people are concerned after designation, a lot of those concerns don't actually bear out. And again, as we start a relationship prior to designation, we continue that relationship going forward into the future. And so um, in terms of the, the benefits, I think that um, we try to be a very accessible agency. We try to work closely to with help owners achieve their needs and their desires for their property. Um, we also can provide technical assistance that's, that's actually free from our expert staff. And, um, and I think that ultimately many people find that it is a great honor to be designated. Well, um, as you know, I, I serve on a council where there are a good number of members who frequently disagree with the Supreme Court. So <laughs> while it is the law of the land, it doesn't mean that they always <laughs> get everything right. And I recognize that's a generations ago decision uh, that landmarking is not a taking. Um, I will also note that, that uh, while I agree with uh, uh, the last land use chair uh, on many things, uh, this is one that I agree with in particular. Uh, Intro 775 was, was a wise bill and it was, I think, uh, something that the Landmarks Preservation Commission needed and I think that you, under your leadership and under the chair's leadership, it's actually moved forward uh, uh, steps and leaps and bounds to, to get the process well. But also with that comes, of course, what some view as maybe perhaps a rush, and uh, this is not really about Huberty House, house, but it's really about the general feel of an owner owns a home, it's their home, and then here comes Bigfoot City stepping in yeah. and saying, we think this is best, and perhaps the city is right, but then at the end, they are faced with that. And what I didn't hear, um, I think, is what, you know, th there's working with the mm -hmm. owner, of course, mm -hmm. to make them more comfortable with the mm -hmm. His decision, and and there's working with the owner to show them that it's not as bad as they think it might be. But at the end, there are some detriments. There perhaps are a lot of compliments, but there are some detriments. And I don't think that we as a city have done enough. I think, um, and this is not on the commission, but this is perhaps on us as well as legislators and on our predecessor councils. But to to create a system where owners of private homes, not developers, mm -hmm. but those who have had homes in their family for a very long time are not properly compensated uh, and are not properly handheld, if you will, uh, through the process and then what happens on the day after. For example, I don't believe, and I could be wrong, but that uh, has anybody at LPC actually had a relationship ongoing with the owners of Uberty? If, if that's true, I would love yeah. to hear, uh, post-landmarking. Right. And of course, um, you know, 
post landmarking, the other thing to remember is that the Landmarks Commission doesn't compel owners to make changes. And so unless the owner is seeking to make a change and comes to us, we don't necessarily right. have that dialogue. But when they do come to us, we work hard to have a, a partnership. And I agree. I think that um, you know there are a lot of concerns. The commission regulates a number of um, homeowners properties across the city, and I think um, you know successfully. So. All right. And and my final comment, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. My final comment is uh, I I do again appreciate very much uh, the work that the commission has done to make Intro 76 make uh, Local Law 76 mm -hmm. real, uh, to do it uh, the way the sponsors had intended, there were 33 co-sponsors on the last council, um, and it had a, an enormous amount of support in the city, and I think the commission has done a fine job in bringing that to fruition and making that happen. So thank, thank you, you again, Madam Director. I look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you. Uh, before we continue, I want to just recognize um, my council, Elizabeth Guzman, and also the staff members of the council's invest Gative Unit, Chuck Davis, Chief Compliance Officer, and Andre Johnson Brown, Investigator. If the council gives its advice and consent, followed by appointment by the mayor, Sarah Carroll, a Queens resident, will fill a current vacancy at the LPC. Subsequently, she will be designated chair of co the commission and will complete the remainder of a three-year term expiring June 28, 2019. And now uh, we are going to hear from the public. I'm going to call people three at a time. Rachel Levy, Sharida Paulson. Did I pronounce your name right or wrong? Sherida. 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 Not really, but. <laughs> <laughs> and Cass Stachelberg. I lived with that all my life, so people. Pick who you want to start. <laughs> Is this on? Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Koslowitz, and thank you to the members of the council for being here uh, and allowing me to testify. I'm Rachel Levy. I'm the executive director of Friends of the Upper East Side Historic Districts. Friends of the Upper East Side Historic Districts, founded in 1982, is an independent, not-for-profit membership organization dedicated to preserving the architectural legacy, livability, and sense of place of the Upper East Side. With over 20 years of professional experience at the Landmarks Preservation Commission, most recently serving as executive director since 2014, Ms. Carroll is certainly no stranger to the agency, as you know. She comes to this role with an intimate knowledge of New York City's historic buildings, in addition to the agency's operations, policy, and strategic planning. We look forward to continuing to work toward our city's preservation together. The Upper East Side lays claim to institutions of global renown spanning decades of cultural investment from the Met to the Guggenheim on Museum Mile. The most visited scenic landmark in the world, Central Park, is right in our backyard. We also are proud of our livable, lovable streetscapes like Lexington Avenue, which boasts its own institutions, the mom and pop shops established generations ago that continue to serve residents and visitors alike. From white brick to brownstone, we cherish the Upper East Side's unique sense of place. It is what make this, makes this neighborhood and this city great. As stewards of the neighborhood, we seek to preserve and protect all of the distinct areas that comprise the Upper East Side. Apart from the Gold Coast neighborhoods bordering Central Park and the, are the modest neighborhoods east of Park Avenue, which have always been and remain a diverse, family-oriented, and affordable area. Rich in immigrant history and human-scaled fabric, Yorkville is a thriving, vibrant neighborhood spurred in part by the wave of development that has followed the recent opening of the Second Avenue subway, Yorkville is also on the cusp of great change. 
As part of our mission to foster a balance between continued growth and preservation, Friends has been working diligently to highlight the buildings and sites that continue to convey Yorkville's singular sense of place. Our concerns are not limited by the boundaries of the Upper East Side. We're also working to support the creation of land use policies that foster common sense zoning that will lead to balanced development, as well as the inclusion of open space, transportation, infrastructure, affordable housing, and historic preservation goals in equal measure. We very much look forward to working together toward these important goals. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair Koslowitz. My name is Sherida Paulson. I'm a former chairman of the commission. I also served as a commissioner for nine years. And Sarah Carroll and I pretty much started at the commission at the same time. Since I left the commission, I, as an architect, um, have made many applications to the commission. So I understand many of the different roles related to this. Sarah is the most qualified person to lead this commission for the future. Um, I will miss not having her look at the applications on a day-to-day -day basis, but she is the most qualified. She is obviously the most knowledgeable for the preservation part, but she's also, through her role as executive director, intimately acquainted now with the archaeology, the designation process, with um, all the different components of landmarks, and just vote to approve her and get her in there as soon as possible. <laughs> I think you can see from the number of people who have come here today and from the variety, this, this is well received. Thank you, Chair Kozlowitz, for the opportunity. My name is Cass Stackelberg. I'm a partner at the uh, preservation consulting firm of Higgins, Quaysbarth and Partners. Um, I'm joined by one of my partners, Ward Dennis, who's also here with me. Um, I've known Sarah for 20 years, and I can't think of anybody more capable, more qualified, and in a uh, familiar word, appropriate, um, <laughs> for the position of um, commissioner and, and chair of the Landmarks Preservation Commission. Um, our firm has participated with Sarah in a full range of projects of varying scales, um, building types, uh, the full spectrum for many years. And in all instances, Sarah has proven herself to be a professional preservationist uh, extending, and this extends to her assessment of applications, her interactions with the public and her staff, uh, and a tremendous respect for the process. Um, I first met Sarah uh, when she was just a, a preservation staff member uh, 20 years ago, and I've continued to work with her as a, uh, when she became a deputy, then the director of preservation, and now uh, as executive director. Um, from her educational background and years of experience at Landmark, she is well-versed in all aspects of the preservation field, from research and documentation to designation to the technical requirements uh, for restoration, uh, design, and of course, uh, the process. Um, as been stated before, at the heart of the Landmark's law is the recognition that the city is a dynamic and always changing uh, place, and Landmark's is charged with the task of regulating this. And Sarah's long-standing understanding of this and her experience with the agency makes her so qualified to both oversee change uh, and to preserve the city's architectural and cultural heritage. Um, on a more personal level, she's also just a wonderful person to work with. <laughs> she, uh, her dedication to public service and everybody who comes before her, she treats with tremendous respect, uh, and she's just a, she's a wonderful person to have the chance to, uh, to interact with. So for all those reasons, I have no doubt that Sarah um, a long-standing preservation professional will be an effective leader of the agency and an excellent chair. Thank you. Simeon Bankoff, Bob Tierney, and Ann Friedman. Good afternoon, uh, Council Members. Simeon Bankoff, Executive Director of the Historic Districts Council. 
The Historic Districts Council is the citywide advocate for New York's historic neighborhoods. We are de dedicated to defending the integrity of the New York Landmarks Law and to furthering the preservation ethic, and as such, the appointment of a new chair to the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission is of utmost interest to us. We're the only citywide organization that reviews all public proposals affecting historic buildings and is present for all public proceedings of the LPC. Therefore, we have a long working relationship with Sarah Carroll, whom we have corresponded, collaborated, socialized, partnered with, and argued against for close to 25 years. In that time, we've been impressed with Ms. Carroll's professionalism, thoughtfulness, communicative, communicative nature, and steadfast dedication to the agency. She is someone who has devoted herself to ensuring the Landmarks Commission succeeds and prospers. She possesses an admirable institutional memory and an intimate familiarity with the workings of the agency. We look forward to her using her skills and experience to further the mission of the LPC by increasing its outreach and bringing its services to all, aid all New Yorkers in preserving our city's irreplaceable public heritage. Landmarks has an enormous mission with a very narrow focus, which is to safeguard the buildings and places that represent New York's cultural, historical, uh, social, political history in order to stabilize and improve property values, foster civic pride, protect and enhance the attractions for tourists, strengthen the economy of the city, and promote the use of landmarks for the education, pleasure, and welfare of the people. The agency does this through the public regulation of individual properties, building by building, one at a time. It's easy for commissioners and even advocates to get mired in the details of an individual project and lose sight of the forest for the trees, but avoiding this is one of the most important roles of a chair. The leader of this agency must always take the long view. Landmark designation is a permanent and lasting commitment. The chair must consider how the width of a window transom will affect a historic streetscape when multiplied by dozens of years of people passing it as they, seeing it as they pass by. The chair must try to foresee how the possible replacement of a pedestrian building might do to a, a block of 19th century apartment buildings, or how raising the roof of a parish hall 12 rather than 8 feet might ruin the visual composition of a historic church complex forever. It's not easy to try to envision the lasting effects of decision, a design decision made in the eighth hour of a public hearing, but it is necessary. We know that uh, Ms. Carroll understands this better than um, understands better than most the responsibilities of landmark designation and the everyday grind of regulation and enforcement. We believe that having been eyewitness and party to, dec to decades of preservation activity, she also has a deep appreciation for the benefits and importance of historic preservation principles to the pe people of the city of New York and its soul. If appointed, we know that she will bring that appreciation, a thorough understanding of the agency's workings and a proven professionalism to her role. We ask her as the leader of the Landmarks Commission to take the hard road, to be cautious in granting permission and be expansive in giving protection. Our city will be better for it. Okay, I'm Bob Tierney. I was chairman of this commission. Proudly honored to be chair. And I, ha and I just have to say, a great one, and you are very lucky to have him here to testify on your behalf. Uh, <laughs> and I am proud to be here. It's my honor, truly, to be here on behalf of Sarah Carroll. I've seen her during those 13, thir 11 and a half years that I was at Landmarks uh, do everything that has been talked about here today, and it isn't just talk. She, as they say, she's, she's walked it and does it every day and has done it and will continue to do it in even more expansive responsibility and authority that I, mean, I can't think of anyone who would be more qualified. She is uniquely qualified, actually, in the true meaning of the word unique. There's only one person, truly, with the kind of experience that she has, the kind of temperament, the skill, the expertise, the intelligence, you name it. It's all there. I think you've seen it for yourselves today. I think you've seen it over the years as she has interacted not only with this council but with the public. And uh, I saw it up close as she interacted with the chair of the agency, the other commissioners to run the hearings, to be even tempered, to be, when necessary, tough. You may not see the, didn't have to be, it wasn't with yelling or it wasn't with, with uh, a temper. It was with firmness and with decisive authority and with great sensitivity. So it's a spectacular appointment. Um, I'm gonna not repeat what's been said here before as they say, Lots, everything's been said, but not everyone has said it, and I'm not going to repeat those things, but I am going to, if I may. I'm currently on the board of the uh, Fund for the City of New York, a great organization, which among many other things uh, administers the Sloan Awards. 
to uh, city employees, uh, outstanding city employees every year. I think everyone's familiar with the Sloan Awards. It's, a, it, it's an extremely important recognition uh, by the Fund for the City of New York and by the city for, as it says here, honoring extraordinary New York City public servants since 1973. And I would like to just read uh, from the certificate, the blurb, if you will, that when Sarah was given this award in 2012 by the Fund for the City of New York. And I now know by being on the board the nature of the, of the process, the search, the extensive re, uh, examination of there are 240,000 employees that are potentially eligible for this. And there are 12 a year that get, six a year that get it. And over the, since 1973, there have only been 230 winners uh, of this exceptional uh, recognition. And uh, of those, by the way, I did check today, yesterday, how many have actually, how many have gone on to become chair of agents, to head agencies of the 230 winners? And only five. And Sarah will be the sixth with the council's approval. So I will not read this incredible, but I'll put it in the record, if I may, uh, what the city, what the Sloan Awards, her certificate at the awarding at Cooper Union of the Sloan Award, what it said about her performance, and by the way, it all happens to be true. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I have a little quote from the Sloan Award in my testimony, oh, so hopefully I'll get to that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, good morning, Chair Koskowitz <laughs> and the Council of Members. I'm Ann Friedman, speaking on behalf of the New York Landmarks Conservancy. The Conservancy is a private, non-for-profit organization founded in 1973. Our mission is to preserve historic resources throughout New York by advocacy, and technical and financial assistance. The Conservancy is pleased to support the appointment of Sarah Carroll as chair of the Landmarks Preservation Commission. We've always had a strong relationship with the agency and have known and worked with Ms. Carroll for over two decades as she rose through the ranks of the Preservation Department before becoming executive director. Like many other groups, we have encouraged the administration to appoint a chair with a background in preservation and in selecting Sarah Carroll, we have certainly fulfilled that request. On a personal note, I worked with Sarah at LPC in the late 1990s, where she was a model of friendly efficiency. More recently, from the vantage point of a homeowner, I got to witness Sarah at work in my community, clearly and simply explaining the regulatory impact of the expansion of my own Brooklyn Historic District. Sarah's a native New Yorker, having lived um, in at least or adjacent to at least three historic districts and two boroughs, and this shows. Um, and we actually had a contest to write the most permits every month. So it's it's a little thing. In 2012, when Ms. Carroll was the LPC's Director of Preservation, she received the Sloan Public Service Award, which recognizes outstanding civil servants. At the time, she was lauded for her keen ability to help architects, developers, and contractors, and property owners navigate the complicated rules and regulations that govern New York City landmarks. Although applications to the commission are often contentious, Carol's unusual and admirable calm, sensitivity, and impartiality have made her a singularly effective negotiator, helping broker compromises to which all sides can agree. Her tenure as executive director has burnished that record, and we are sure it will continue when she is chair. Thank you for the opportunity to present my views. Judith Saltzman and Paige Cowley. You have four chairs? Uh, okay, and Albert Labor. Good afternoon. I'm George Calderaro. I'm a longtime New York City preservationist, cur currently serving on the boards of the 29th Street Neighborhood Association, the Victorian Society of New York, the Historic Districts Council, and the Friends of the Upper East Side Historic Districts. I'm here to support the nomination of Sarah Carroll, with whom I've been acquainted for 25 years since I hired her for her... <laughs> 
first job at the New York at the Landmarks Preservation Commission. It's my proudest achievement. Um, though I left the commission shortly thereafter with the arrival of the Giuliani administration, during the ensuing years, I've been consistently impressed by the qualities I originally saw in Sarah, namely integrity, honesty, and preservation knowledge. I commend her highly to you. I must also commend the mayor's office for responding to the urgent, urgent request to appoint a tried and true preservationist. For too long, the commission has been seen and criticized for being too acquiescent to the real estate and development community. A well-known preservation lawyer has stated publicly that he's never been as busy as he is now responding to communities across the city seeking to protect their landmarks and historic districts through legal action. In Nomad, for example, proposals for an expansion of the Madison Square North Historic District have laid fallow for years, while landmark-worthy buildings have succumbed to the proverbial wrecking ball. Within the proposed district is Tin Pan Alley, where American popular music was invented and promoted globally, establishing New York as the nation's cultural capital. These few buildings on West 28th Street could easily become yet another hotel, joining more than a dozen hotels on 28th Street between Broadway and 7th Avenue, which contribute nothing to New Yorkers' lives and not to mention history. I am confident that Sarah Carroll has the knowledge and fortitude to preserve this and other important examples of our built heritage. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, oh. Good afternoon. Yes. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm Judith Saltzman. As an architect and preservationist practicing in the city of New York for over 30 years, I would like to offer my enthusiastic support of Sarah Carroll as chair of the Landmarks Commission. Ms. Carroll brings the requisite preservation philosophy, technical expertise, communication skills, and administrative know-how to lead the Landmarks Commission. She has been dedicated to our city's architectural, historic, and cultural heritage for over 20 years, working her way up through the ranks of the commission to her current role of executive director. Those of us who have worked with Sarah over the decades have enormous respect for her intelligence, thoughtfulness, diligence, fairness, her ability to listen and evaluate all critical qualities for the chair of the commission. Sarah Carroll is a professional of the highest order. She has a depth of knowledge of the city's history and an understanding of the need to protect and engage landmarks and future landmarks in the city's ongoing development. As a longstanding member of the Municipal Art Society's Preservation Committee, I am also pleased to deliver a separate letter, which I've handed in, of support for Sarah Carroll. Um, and it states in part, MAS is delighted that Mayor de Blasio has selected a true preservationist to lead the agency we fought hard to create and continue to promote through our advocacy. Ms. Carroll's decades of experience working at the LPC demonstrated dedication to New York City's historic and cultural her heritage that is unmatched. In fact, she was honored with the Sloan Public Service Award, which I think everyone now knows about, recognizing her long career of civil service. We look forward to our continued work with the LPC and Ms. Carroll in particular, end of quote. Um, the chair of the Landmarks Preservation Commission is a position of enormous, enormous importance in our city. I encourage the city council to expeditiously confirm Ms. Carroll as chair. Our city will benefit. Is this on? Thank you. My name is Paige Cowley. I write in support for Sarah Carroll. Um, as an architect in private practice, I also serve as co-chair of the Land Use Committee for Community Board 7 in Manhattan, and I'm also the chair of Landmark West on the Upper West Side. I write this letter, though, as a licensed preservation architect only because our community board couldn't meet to unanimously support you, <laughs> but I do now have a phone call from Landmark West, and the board is also behind this um, nomination as well. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting Sarah when she came to the commission in 1994 when I was seeking information about historic buildings. 
for a former um, employer. Who knew that 24 years later I would have the privilege of writing this recommendation? I also learned, after working with Ms. Carroll, enough of all this public stuff, um, that for many years she lived on my street <laughs> and was a babysitter for all the people I used to babysit for <laughs> that still live in these historic designated buildings. But over the years, I've had the pleasure of working with Ms. Carroll on a variety of landmark issues, from straightforward repairs to complicated building additions. And with every application, she's been wholeheartedly engaged, providing guidance and reassurance to my firm's private and governmental agencies, uh, clients. And for many of these applications, Ms. Carroll served as a preservation specialist guiding these projects as the agency, agency liaison through public hearing and the permitting processes. Her comportment, and this is important, is as an official representative of the Landmarks Preservation Commission has been remarkable in many ways. Not only in sharing likely scenarios stating the level of risk um, while being ever so truthful, but listening to owners' requirements and appreciating the level of intervention that our practice considers for con certain complex or phased projects. Her level of knowledge about the entirety of the New York City landmarks process is extensive, but it is her ability to respond to special circumstances and preservation issues with extraordinary fairness that makes her an exceptional candidate for this important position. In summary, she possesses all of the characteristics I think are required for the chair of this essential city agency, expertise, enthusiasm, intelligence in all sense of the word, and objectivity. I believe that Sarah Carroll not only has the qualifications, but the dedication to adhere to the principles established by those founders of this important legislation that secures our existing landmarks and historic districts, as well as those buildings and sites yet to be designated. I urge you to make this appointment a reality. Thank you. Hi, uh, thanks for having me. Um, my name is Albert Lebose. I'm a principal of the United American Land, and I'm writing, I'm here to express my unqualified support for Sarah Carroll to be the next chair of the New York City, City Landmarks Preservation Commission. As a principal of my family business, family real estate business, which is a development firm, we, we have over 40 buildings that is under the jurisdiction of uh, the LPC. And we had the occasion to work with S Sarah for the past 20 years in her various capacities. My experience with Sarah is that she's been tough but fair. To my chagrin, she's no pushover. <laughs> she's very knowledgeable and sensitive of all preservation matters and procedure while managing owner's expectations by giving fair and honest direction. On a, cu on a customer service basis, which is very, very important for owners, she's been very, very responsive to us, especially if there's been any major issues. She's always there to pick up the phone and reply to us immediately. So I can't think of anybody better than Sarah with the requisite knowledge, experience, temperament, and respect to be the next chair. So I urge you to approve her. Thank you. Um, this hearing on the rules, privileges, and elections now stands in recess to be continued on the morning of September 26th for a vote. But Sarah, do not lose any sleep over this. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll be voting on September 26th. Thank you. This meeting is in recess.